preparing to live stream the meeting. So she did set it up right. I just didn't know what to click on. Setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. It's loading. Done. Redirecting to YouTube. You need to share your screen again or no? And we are live. We are? Yes, we are live. Um, I see you smiling, but you're we're there. Like, uh, here, hold on one second. Well, <laughs> Johnny, I, don't need, I don't need your screen. I just see what I see. Okay, hold on one second. I'll just go uh, here. I'm gonna send you a. I'm gonna send you it so you can actually see what's going on. Um, this looks it. exactly like it did five minutes ago. When we... Okay, well, it's because we're on Zoom. Here, click on that. Click on what? Uh, go in the chat. Oh, there's a link. Click on that. You should see us. Oh yeah. Yes. So hey. we're here, but nobody else is here. So I don't know what's happening. Um, oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. Well, I got give them this link. I think so. Um, so hold on. I got to, let me click on this link and I got to go back in there. Hold on. I got to whole start, start a whole new thing. Just give me one second. Oh, there is a delay. Yes, that's why you got to mute YouTube itself or else you'll go insane. I'll turn off YouTube. Yeah, cute. Yeah, turn up them. Yeah, turn mute. So, because, yeah, so don't pay attention to what you don't look at you and don't look at me. Um, oh, but it says AMA. Oh, I see what it did. It started a whole new thing. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I'm furious. That's all the time we have today, folks. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. So now people should start popping on. Okay. So we are here. Well, don't I need to be on YouTube to see the chat, what they have to say? That that YouTube link I just sent you should show oh, it so to I you. I thought you said shut it down. Now I'm back again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The old one. The old one. Oh, okay. Dan B just showed up. Okay. Uh, okay, Robbie just jumped on. Okay. All right. So I do want YouTube on in the corner here? You do, because so you can see the actual chat. So you don't want to look at Zoom. Stay logged on to Zoom, because Zoom right now is talking to YouTube. And there's Stacy. Okay. All right. We are rocking and rolling. So I don't want to look at the Zoom screen. No. You want to look, at, look the... at the YouTube screen where I'm frozen right now. Oh, that's interesting. Nice. Okay. Okay. But we are here and <laughs> okay. Everybody's move. Okay. So people are moving over. So that's good. Okay. All right. Well then we'll get started as uh, people are, are popping in. So, so hello everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We are here. We are on YouTube live. Thank you very much for showing up. My name is Tom Deere. I am the VO strategist. I'm a voiceover business and marketing consultant with over 25 years of experience as a, a blue collar voice actor, um, experience with e-learning explainers, audiobooks, commercials, just got into political uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And um, this is a uh, ask me anything session. And we have a special guest here. This is Johnny Heller. Johnny Heller is a veteran award-winning audiobook narrator with over a thousand credits, um, uh, titles to his credit. He's won pretty much every award that you can win as an audiobook narrator. And Johnny is also a, a, a real life, very close to your personal friend. And I'm very happy to have him on here. Um, we are here to chat about voiceovers in general and audiobooks in particular. So for those of you who have not jumped in on a YouTube live session before, um, if you want to join the conversation, ask your questions, share anything, uh, suggestions, musings, snide remarks, war stories, or otherwise, just please uh, type it into the chat and we will answer everything in the order that we see them. So, all right, I see Johnny is chatting, so he's in there. And I see Dan and I see Robbie. Hi, Robbie and like Stacy. Great, I know, right? I, we're, I And Miss Molly, no wait, no, she was Miss Molly, but anyway. But hi, Dee, nice to see you. So. Everybody, uh, we're here to talk about audiobooks in particular, and but you can also jump in with any of your voiceover questions. Wait, so, wait, so um, how, how do people, how do they get over? Because Joanna just sent me a note and she can't get over here. Oh, she can't get over there. 
That's Wait, interesting because hey, there's a link there. Can you not get over? It? Yeah, there's a link to click in there. There's a link to click in the chat on the old YouTube live channel because for some reason it wasn't working. So I had to start a new one. He started a new YouTube. Everybody's coming over. I don't know how it works, baby. <laughs> okay. Yes, there we are, Marie. Sorry about that. Um, I had a little trouble with it um, because we, we're Johnny and I are on Zoom talking to each other, and then um, my tech person set it up that I just click on something and it takes us over to YouTube Live. But it took it, it but it created a whole new live stream as opposed to the scheduled one. Um, so but you're all here. From how do they get from what you set up to where they are now? There's a you, there, I, I pasted a link in the chat that says a everyone go chat, here. Where? in the uh in the waiting room of the old youtube live okay. joanne in the waiting room of the old youtube place <laughs> is a link that you click on to go here exactly bruce okay yes all, right. all you can see is tom is johnny and myself but nobody else and i can't see you that's right on youtube live viewers participate through the chat so you are exactly where you want to be my friend and it's very nice to see you bruce um well sort of see you i see your handsome little Avatar. It's a very small circle where I can see your smiling face. And you spectacles. guys also need to know that there is a there's a delay from what we do, mm -hmm. what we say, and then when it shows up on the screen, because we have just, you know, here's our the YouTube pictures up here. So there's Tommy and there's me. It's like right Hello. now, side by side for you guys. It's Tommy on top, me in the bottom right here. Cause you know, yeah, he's the top and I'm the bottom. You know how it goes. And um, and then okay. and then on, on the, the we say stuff, and then about you know, a few minutes later it shows up on the on the youtube yeah you know, it was weird time. it's a little yeah, disconcerting but what happened crazy. what happened last time is what i did last month's is um uh, i didn't turn off the mute so i was hearing everything like in five second delay so i almost had a stroke it was terrible but yeah robbie yeah, if you have a question type it in yeah everybody if you have any comments or anything or any questions anything you'd like to share now is the time to do it so please put in your questions and johnny and i will be happy to answer them this is uh this is interesting and not exactly uh mistake proof huh uh nothing is exactly mistake proof uh but yes this is uh i i subscribe to a lot of people who do youtube live regularly and they have a it's well at least to me as a viewer it's all seamless and set up and they have all these graphics they can like make graphics and stuff pop up on the screen it's let, let very exciting question how, sure. how come how come you're doing youtube couldn't you just do facebook live because that's yes um the reason i was advised to do uh youtube live is because um it's mostly for search engine optimization and page ranking and to get because uh, we want see now you're everybody's going to hear what's going on behind the curtain is that um you know, the purpose of, a, of an AMA or a live event is to, you know, connect with all these wonderful people out here, but also it's for subscribers to jump onto YouTube and be a part of my channel because my video, I blog, my video, I do my video blog like you do now, and I have like little reels and stuff like that. So there's that. Oh, Bruce has a question. Is there yeah, a consensus? Of course, it's a tech question. Of course it is. Is there a consensus among audiobook publishers about what raw audio means? For example, does, does running only... RX9 mouth click still make its raw audio. So Johnny, what's your answer? <laughs> well, thanks for that question, Bruce. I don't know what the hell RX9 mouth to click is. It's a plugin. Basically, it's, a, it's a something that you run to take all the clicks out of your audio without having to do it manually. My, my feeling is that if you run something that, if here's your raw audio and then you do something, then it isn't raw audio anymore. Whether there's a consensus about that, I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I think Joanna, who uses the same setup I do, but she has, I think, a D-click thing. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, so I, the answer is I, I don't know what their consensus is. My personal feeling is if it's raw audio, it should be raw audio. Right. I could be, I don't, I just, I'm not a tech guy. I don't know. Okay. Well, you and I talked about this a few weeks ago. I asked you at the voiceover mixer and you said that you do your punch and roll and you do literally nothing with the audio. You just punch and roll and then you just send it off. Is that I right? I punch and roll, I consolidate it and off it goes in the WAV files and the people okay. go and fix it. So they're the ones that make sure that it's according to spec with the intros and outro, you know, how much 
how many seconds of silence there should be at the beginning and the end and in between chapters. So they I do give, all I give that room on their tone end. in the very first chapter or the prologue or the intro. I give them room tone. Mm, OK. And, OK. And there you have it. And then and then the rest is just me. And then I don't I don't. Uh, I don't I don't uh, I don't do anything. I don't want it. It's you don't it's want not, to do it's anything. Not my job. I'm, right. I'm acting. I'm right. Busy. I, um, I'm going to go see some of these questions. We go back. Right. So that's oh. the answer, Bruce. The answer is I don't know. Okay, now. <laughs> so Ravi has a question. Okay, I have a semi-new client who sent an abnormally long audition, 13 minutes. What is a good way to let them know in a nice professional manner that is way too long? Uh, okay, well, I mean, the, the best way to do it is usually two pages. That's usually the standard audition uh, length for a, for an audio book, in Not my experience. No, I, I find frequently it's five pages, seriously. Really? Um, yeah. That long? Yeah, um, it just depends. Usually, if they ask you, if they ask you to audition, they send you the audition material. Now, sometimes they'll send the entire manuscript, and they say just pick a piece, which mm -hmm. is crazy. But mm -hmm. generally, they'll say read pages three to seven, mm -hmm. or something. So you do that. If they sent thirteen minutes on their own, say you know what, you should if you want to listen, say I listen the first couple minutes. Please, in the future, don't make it more than I, I'd say more than four minutes. I would blame the industry. Uh, I would say, just FYI, the industry standard for audiobook auditions is five pages. Yeah, yeah, five, yeah, three to five pages. Three to five pages. So you, you don't. I mean, occasionally I've sent in seven to ten minute auditions, but generally three to five minutes is about right. Thirteen minutes is absurd. I mean, they haven't done the book yet. Yeah, that's too. That's too much time to be putting into an audition. And I don't know, Robbie, if you ask them for an audition or they just sent some material in, that makes a difference too. Mm -hmm. to approach it. What you should do, if it happens again, is be specific in your audition requests. I want this much. Just give me four minutes. And right. In general, let them know. An average audiobook audition. Well, I guess we just covered that, Robbie. Said, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Bruce is clarifying his question. He's talking about raw audio for auditions, not the book itself. Well, if it's a raw audition, I would just punch and roll it and just send it off. You know, because yeah, if you're punch I, and rolling, I, I there's no burps, boo boos, or curses or anything weird in there. So if you're punch and rolling effectively, then yeah, yeah, you could totally send that off. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat that, John. My audition is exactly the same as um, my my book policy. I, it's um, as as I punch and roll and send it in. So they get mm -hmm. they get it. They know what my booth sounds like, what I sound like, what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I you know again, I don't. I don't do anything. Um, <laughs> I think I do know a lot of, I know that uh, McMillan and those guys, they like, and some people want this on your, on your, on your website. Here's some processed audio. Here's some unfinished raw audio so that the publisher knows what you, what it sounds like before you did tech crap to it. Um, I think it's important just, <coughs> pardon me. I think it's important just to, um, just to sound as honest as you can. This is what you're going to get from me. Mm -hmm. And if you do your own, uh, editing and mastering all this stuff. Give an example of that too. But I believe punch a roll pretty much raw is the way to go. Yeah. So I'm putting my uh, website link in there, tomdeer.com, because I have a, a bit on the front page where you hear me talking just about the gear that I have. So they have an opportunity to hear what my raw sound in my booth sounds like. Um, that may not be a, uh, that may be something that some or, or many of you want to do is just, you know, say, hi, this is me. I'm sitting in this booth. Here's the microphone I'm talking into. You know, this is the audio interface and this is the uh, this is the DAW that I use. Here's a little bit of room tone so you can hear it. And you're just quiet for like five seconds and say, hey, if you have any other questions, just reach out and, you know, email me. And, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you. Thanks. You know, just do a little something like that. All right. Uh, okay. What was weird is they crammed it on four pages. Okay. Yeah. Whoa, they, that I yeah, Did that 13, 13, min 13 minutes on four pages. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. They can read small print pretty It well. was six point yeah. font. You must have you amazing one, vision, one Robbie. One page of a standard book is one page is two to Hi, three Todd. Minutes. Oh, Todd says hello. Hi. New says hi, Tom and Johnny. Hello, Todd. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Todd. Well, we are just getting started with questions for uh, Johnny yeah, Heller about late, all so things audiobook. Yeah, we can run a little bit late unless, you know, people get sick of listening to us and then we'll just, you know, go somewhere else and do do something else. But yes, everybody, we welcome all of your questions uh, about audio, about voiceover in general and audio books in port particular. Marie to be, says- that's, To be honest, I don't, I don't really care what you ask me. I'll answer anything. What's the capital of Egypt? 
Cairo. There you go. Okay. Yay. Uh, Marie says, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to add a different soundtrack to my website. Thanks, guys. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yeah, Robbie. That does sound like a bit of a crazy audition. It's funny because um, uh, somebody was just posting this morning on Facebook about where's the line when it comes to educating clients. And the point that the poster was making is that there are some clients, potential clients, who will never pay you what you're worth or pay you what is the union or non-union industry standard. And the question is, you know, should you bother? And people voice their uh, opinions on that. And my opinion is like, you don't know until you ask. Um, I always assume that it's an opportunity for education because there's a lot of first time audiobook publishers, maybe it's just the author uh, who says, just wants to turn their book into an audiobook, but they haven't the faintest idea how to go about it. And they did some Googleizing and they found you. Um, and educating a client is a great way to get a client for life. So if you can educate them on the process and educate them on the rate structure and they go with it, then you know, educating a client can be a huge tool for long-term marketing. In, in the in the in the on the other side of that coin, if you're asked to audition and it's a, they give you 50 pages or something, you say Here, here's here's a uh, four minutes, right? That because you, I mean it's because some people don't realize what they're asking you to do is more than than should be asked. Mm -hmm. um, no, nothing is worse than working overly hard to get a job that you don't get. Yes. Um, and so you need, so I, there's, no, there's no, there's no rudeness in sharing information as long as you're sharing it politely. Uh, um, you can even say, perhaps you're not aware or, you know, don't even say that. Just say, you know, here's what's normally done. So I'll, if you don't mind, I'll do that. Right. In my experience, or according to the industry standard, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. this is this is usually what it is. If you have any questions, you know, I'm happy to I'm happy to expand on that or, you know, help you if you need any additional information. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. 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 you come at it from you come at it from, you know, I want to work with you, even if you find out that you don't <laughs> uh, based on project or you know, the the rate or how difficult they are, but always take it from an approach of, I want to do everything I can to set you first time audiobook publisher up for success. Then here are the standards. Um, Melinda asks, how do you typically book a new project? Do independent authors reach out to you directly or do you have a publisher you usually work with closely? What, what's your experience, Johnny? Well, my experience in general is publishers generally contact me with either in, offer to audition for a book i'm happy you understand <laughs> we still audition actors audition or they or they offer me a book um for example audible after god five six years or nothing just came out here's two books we have for you um so it's had to work out the date so there was no audition just they just gave it to me other people reach out um sometimes they say here's johnny we have uh penguin random House wants you to audition mcmillan wants me to audition uh dreamscape i audition unless they have a book that they want me for. Independent authors do reach out or I reach out to them if I want to do their book. It just depends on how much time. Um, uh, typically, um, I, I don't have a publisher. I work for a number of publishers. I think it's very important, regardless of where you are in the industry, to make sure that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, that you work for a number of, uh, that your clients are numerous, as numerous as you can possibly make it and keep yourself going because you never know. I know that, for example, I work for Tantor a lot. Well, let's say Tantor doesn't, says, I've used Johnny too much. Let's give him a break for six months, which is nothing to them, but forever for me. Well, then I need to make sure Blackstone's there or an independent author or something. Um, I do, I still, Melinda's also a second question. I don't need to audition as much. I really do audition a lot. Um, I don't mean to think people just, you know, here's a book, here's a book, here's a book. They do, a lot of the times they'll come, a publisher generally will come, Johnny, we want you to audition. If a publisher says that to you, they probably have uh, have it in mind that it's you or it's Tom or or it's or it's Bruce. And they have those three guys who are, they're going to send up and one of you is going to get it. Um, so generally uh, audition, and if it's an open audition, like on the uh, Ahab Talent Portal or, or any of the other portal or ACX or, anything, or Find A Way, any of those guys, um, there, there, there could be as much competition as there is for any commercial you do. Um, I've been working, I work for Spotify now. They've been coming, but they offer me, say, we have a book. Are you interested in auditioning even? Which is a nice way to say, here's what it's about. Do you want to do it? 
Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they get rid of the chaff right away. Yeah. So Melinda, to, to, to zoom out a little bit to get more of a holistic answer, um, is that there are, in voiceovers in general, there's basically three ways that voiceover projects are cast. I call them portals. So it's like, here's you, here's the end client with their project. How do you connect with them? The three portals are representation, agents, managers. Um, the second is online casting sites, like what Johnny said, ACX or Findaway or Ahab. And then the third one is direct marketing efforts, where you are reaching out to a publisher to be asked to be put on their roster for future consideration. Um, typically, agents do not cast audiobooks. You don't have to worry about that portal. So that means your focus is online casting sites and direct marketing efforts. Um, and yeah, ACX, find a way. Ahab and a couple other couple of places are very well known and established online casting sites. So if you're earlier in your audiobook journey, actually anywhere at any point in your audiobook journey, those are places where you can find audiobooks. At the same time, you can also use direct marketing strategies to reach out to publishers, the big the big five, five and a half, whatever you call them now, and a bunch of other ones, um, and reach out to them with your website, with links to your demos, with a breakdown. This is who I am. This is my genre specialties. These are my accents. This is my gear, you know, and then you'll be put up there for future consideration. But Johnny makes a very good point, which is that, I mean, I, this is my, I, it's been 26 years since I booked my first, you know, I booked my first voiceover in 1996 and I'm, a, and I'm a, been a full-time voice actor since 2005. I audition every single day for all types of projects. So I'm not going to say it never gets easier, but it's never smooth sailing. You will always be marketing. You will always be auditioning. You will always be learning, growing, adapting, evolving. Always be Always and always be closing the, the big ABC. Um, and Melinda also says, I remember seeing you don't tend to audition as much anymore because authors already have a new for you in mind for their book. Yes, that's absolutely true. Same thing goes for me. I do a lot of e-learning narration. I do a lot of explainers. And yes, I do have a number of clients that I have done, you know, hundreds of e-learning projects for over the past de few decades or explainer video clients who I've done 10 or 12 uh, explainer videos. No, I don't have to audition for that anymore. But for every one client that comes to me saying, oh, we, you don't need to audition. Here's the gig. There's five to 10 other clients that I have to audition for because either they don't know me or they do know me, but the end client ex insists that an audition gets submitted. Uh, Todd says, what about auditions that send you several scenes from different parts of a book to see how you handle different characters or situations. Johnny, have you ever experienced that? Yeah, sure. Um, they want you to, sometimes it's in a fiction, generally it's a fiction book and they want to see, let's say you're playing, you're, you're going to be playing everybody unless it's a multi-cast thing. So they want to know how you handle um, an emotional scene versus a humorous scene versus a, a murder scene or whatever. So yeah, they can give you, please do a, a, a reading from, uh, chapter seven, page 15 to 16. And then, and also I get a lot of times uh, the multicast they have, uh, I'm playing eight different people they want me to do and say, Johnny, can you give us an example of your eight different characters? And they tell me a little bit about the characters so I can play them, you know? Um, so the, what you do is, um, Todd says, what about those auditions? Well, you just do them. I mean, you read as much as they give you an audition with the best of your ability, what you think it should sound like. Now, sometimes we all know that an author has a voice in their head of a character. Mm. It, it's just, I mean, they can give you the guys from Iowa, he's from South Carolina, whatever. They can tell you what, what they can, but there's no way you can be sure you're going to sound like his best friend from second grade. You know, I mean, who the hell would, how do you do that? So it, it's it's tricky stuff, but whatever, the most they give, whatever they give you, hopefully is helpful for you to nail the audition and get the job. Right. So expand, Johnny, expand on a little bit about what may, something that I'm Todd may be asking about also, not just different types of scenes, but uh, uh, dialects, accents, younger characters, older characters, male, female, female versus female characters. Do you, do you have to be an accent gender age chameleon to be an effective storyteller? I in an audiobook, I, I think not. I think if the author says this guy has a Cajun accent and you can't do one, you need to be honest about that. 
and, and I, as a little plug in my splendiferous workshop that's happening on March 28th, location yet to be determined. Uh, my dear friend Amanda Quaid's going to be there with some other people. We're going to talk about, she's going to do a special session on at this workshop. Um, <laughs> what do you do when you're supposed to do a character voice and you don't know how to do that? You can't like, let's say you need a French accent and you suck at it. What, what are the cheats you can do? Because that's important. In an audition, however, they want to see what you can do. Um, if they're going to give you four or five, they're not going to give you the whole book. They're going to give you a few different characters, male, female, or, or, or different accents. They want to make sure they're cast because a lot of times you'll have on your website or you put on their portal, whatever your, your, um, your, uh, what do you call your, your profile. Um, you'll put up there that you do Australian and German and Scottish and Welsh and stuff. And then they say, well, let's, let's, and then you have no samples of that. So are they going to take your word for it? And the answer is no, probably not. Or if they do and you can't do it, that's going to be bad. Another example of be honest on these things. If you can't do a thing, don't say you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so when the voice is so, but they may want some examples. If a lot of the characters are Eastern European, you know, and, and I promise you, very few of the American listeners, very few of the audible listeners are going to know the difference between an Estonian murderer or a Latvian murderer. Or they're, you know, they're just. Unless you've been murdered by one. Yeah, yeah. Just just watch the new Jack Ryan on, and pick one of those guys. Um, mm. uh, so, but yeah, so whatever that, again, the audition asks you to audition to see if you're the right guy or girl for the job. That's all. If you're not, it doesn't make you a bad person. They'll find someone else for you. Right. I mean, there's also something to be said about how much work you should put into developing dialects and how authentic a dialect should be. If it's too authentic, nobody's going to understand you. However, if it's just an indication of an accent, say Irish, you don't want to sound like the Lucky Charms leprechaun either. So how do you, Johnny, how do you reconcile that? It, it's, it depends. Generally, if there is a single Irish person, it's not just an Irish voice. Nothing is just an accent. It's a human being. It's a mm -hmm. or if not, it could be a fantasy. It could be a, a talking rock. I don't know with an Irish accent. It could be Shrek. I don't know whatever you want, but you need to understand what the character is. Who is this person or this being? Uh, what's their background? What's their attitude? What's the context of the scene? Those are the things that's. It's always whether or not you're playing in a fantasy where there's dragons and people chatting amiably or not or trolls or whatever. They are. They are whoever, they're not aware that being a troll or a talking dragon or a talking flower is unusual. They live in that world. So it's not for you to judge. Who are they? What do they think? You need to cast characters from your frame of reference, not just, you can't just play a voice. Right. The, the best accent in the world does, is no substitute for, for having a grounded character, regardless and, and of how they, they talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if you can't do the full full on, you know, brogue from County Cark, you don't have to, but you, you need to hint around. You can't, if, if it's, if the accent or the ethnicity of a character is indeed important, you have to give some, give, give, you have to play that a little bit. You've got to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. um, but more importantly is what do they feel in the situation, in the scene? Who are they? And that's what the actor needs to do. Absolutely. Um, here's Melinda again about Spotify as a new platform. I don't know about the platform. I, I'm up on there. I have a profile there. I know that people see I, this is going to sound awful, but I know I know a lot of people. So I know the people who run the show. So they contact Joanna and I. They just they contact us. Hey, you guys interested? They try and book us together, which is lovely. So you guys interested in this project? Uh, it's uh, the last project I did. There was a wonderful book called Duped about how, how uh, law enforcement um, gets people to confess to crimes they didn't commit so they can close the cases. And I had to, I, I, while the author, the author wanted to do it himself, but they said, let's listen to a couple auditions. They had me audition and he picked me. He's a really good guy. And this also comes up to um, someone asked a question about an author auditioning, which I didn't quite understand. Uh, let me see if I can find them. Go back for one second. Do casting directors even look at what authors submit for auditions? I'm not sure if you mean what authors submit in terms of what they want or the author actually auditioning to do the book. <coughs> if an author says, here's what I want, sure, they listen. If an author says, I'm going to do my own book, 
sure they listen, especially if that's a deal the publisher had to make to get the author to get the book. A lot of authors are really good writers. And that's where you leave it. Um, yeah. That doesn't uh, really good actors. Yeah, because they don't, they can't make that voice in their head translate to the page because they're not trained storytellers. Yeah. At least vocally. They may are, they may be with the pen, but not with the mouth. Yeah. And when to finish my list, my, my experience with Find Away or Spotify now, I guess, has been wonderful. I, I, I really, really, I like them. They seem like great people. I, um, I have, every, my experience has been absolutely positive. And I think uh, Joanna, my wife, Prairie has done stuff as well. Um, she would say the same. Cool. Uh, Dan asks, what site or sites have open casting for VO, not specifically audiobooks? Well, there are there are dozens and dozens and dozens of free online casting sites, both here in the United States and all over the world. Um, and you can experience some success with those. But the ones that have the um, the most are the uh, called pay to play sites where you need to pay a subscription fee of some sort. Um, there's a number of them out there with some, you know, a few, a few uh, quick Google types typing in, you know, online cat voiceover, online casting sites, voiceover, pay to play sites, you will find many, 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 many of them. And, um, and a good percentage of my voiceover work um, goes through online casting sites, both free and pay to play. Um, if you are having budgetary concerns or resource, if you ha have limited resources, uh, yes, there are there are a bunch out there. It just requires a lot of Googling. Um, however, the ones that have the higher paying uh, opportunities tend to be uh, uh gate kept with a pay to play website because you literally need to pay to play. So with the, so with that in mind, Johnny, um, what online casting sites are you using? I mean, are you on Find a Way? Are you you're on Ahab? Are I'm you on? on? I'm on a, a Dreamscape as a portal. I'm on. I'm on a, a Macmillan sent me a form to fill out. I assume it's a portal, but I, I because I I I don't I don't know what they do with it because they already know who I am. Um, you know, Guy Oldfield has been to the New England workshop like three years in a row, and he still hasn't hired me, the bastard. Um, and I drove him there, too. I know we drove. <laughs> I took him to lunch twice. Uh, son anyway, of a bitch. Um, uh, that was splendid lunch. Anyway. Um, <laughs> it was. Lobster yeah, there, ravioli. Uh, um, oh. So I'm on. Oh, so I'm on. So I'm on uh, the Ahab. Ahab is. Uh, uh, they do some good things, but I have some trouble with their site, to be honest. I love them. But I keep getting auditions for like you know twelve year old uh, uh, Libyan girls. I'm like, what? Well, how do they show up? And that it, it's on my feed. Like I should audition, and I'm not going to do that. Um, in terms of other non audiobook things, I'm not on it. I have agents. I'm signed with Stewart here in New York. I do uh, Apple News with Apple, so I do. Um, most of my stuff is either agent. Um, it comes from agents, or just direct offers to do work. So I don't, I'm not on any of the pay to play. I have been on, who is the one with the bunny? The bunny. Um, voice bunny? Voice bunny. Who is that? Oh, that's, thinking? well, but there's voice bunny and bunny studios. Voice bunny was started by Alex Torrenegra, who I believe was the original founder of Voices voice, one, two, th voice, one, voice two, one, two, three. Voice one, two, three. I was on that. He has since ago. left voice one, two, three. I don't know if he still runs voice bunny. Yeah. that That's the last time I was on any of those. And I, I found that, um, you needed to pay the big money to get the good auditions and, and, you know, the big paying auditions. And a lot of the auditions for me, I couldn't do anyway because they weren't union or they didn't pay enough to make them union. I'm right. Union, so I can't and, do non -union. and that's a, that's a consideration if you're on casting sites, whether you're union or non-union, if you're non-union, you can audition for everything, including the union projects. And then based on whether you're in a right to work state or whether you get, Taft Heart lead, which is if you don't understand what that is, just ask. I'll be happy to explain that to you. But if you are SAG after up, like Johnny is, um, when it comes to audiobooks, audiobooks has the agreement is great because union and non-union voice actors can audition for almost every audiobook and it can and there's a minimum rate. What is it, 225 per finished? I, I, hour? I, I, can't, I can't remember. Maybe 250. I can't 225, remember. 250. Yeah. Which is that, enough. That allows you to do your own uh editing is that they pay a little more. It, right. If they give you like a production stipend for, for that as well. But that, those are also considerations that you want to make when you're when you're looking at online casting sites is your status, uh, your union status. And and yeah, paying to play, you know, to get access to the good stuff. 
like I'd like to tell my students, if you told me 25 years ago that I'd have to pay to watch a Yankees game on television, I would have said you are out of your mind. And now they have the Yes Network. Yeah. So if there is something of value, people are going to make you pay to access that something of value. And, you know, Mr. Steinbrenner made that determination with the Yankees. And it's like, well, okay, then I have a choice. Yeah. Either, yeah, that, either I pay I to watch it or I don't. That's why I subscribe to MLB so I can watch all the games. There you go. Subscribe to MLB Network so you can watch. See, what that's what's nice about that is that Johnny lives here in New York City. He can watch the Padres play the Nationals if it isn't a nationally televised game. So that gives you access to things that you wouldn't have access before, which is great. It opened up that opportunity. But with the Yankees, they took away the opportunity, or at least they gate kept the opportunity. And that's that's just the reality of 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 the of business in general. So that's just what it is. Let's see what here's other questions your, we have here. Here's Marie. Ah, yes. If they give you the whole book, do you typically use the beginning of the book or do you choose a different part of the book for an audition? Well, most of the time they send you an excerpt, but if they don't, what do you usually do, Johnny? I have the last couple, they gave me the whole book, which I thought maybe they want me to know what it's about, but I don't have time to read the whole book if I'm not getting paid for it. I've got eight books. I want to read my own. <laughs> They're piled <laughs> up since last Christmas. Right. I've got, <laughs> um, so what I tend to do, if it's nonfiction, always read the beginning, the intro, because that's everything. It tells you everything that's going to happen in the book. If it's fiction, I just, if they don't tell me, I'd start with chapter one and give them about four minutes or five minutes. Do you Try look for dialogue? Find, huh? Do you look for dialogue? Um, well, I don't. If they're not going to tell me what to read, I give them what they have. I'm not, I don't, I'm just not going to find the best audition. It's like, it's not a theatrical monologue audition where I'm trying to find the best monologue. If they don't have a piece, generally they tell you what they want. If they send me the whole manuscript and I want, and I said, this is not bad, I'll, I'll send a note say, is there a part of it you want me to read for the audition? Because I, you know, where do I go? If it's a 500 page book, where do I go? Mm -hmm. um, and you do want dialogue if it's there, but I don't want to search. So I tend to find, ask them what they want, or you try, one thing you want to do is, if it's up to you and not them, you want something that has a beginning, middle, and an end, if you can. Mm. So here's, uh, yeah. here's a loaded question for you, Johnny. Um, how long do you think publishers listen to your audition before they make a decision about whether they're going to cast you or not? 30 seconds, 15 seconds. Thank you. That's, that's right. Um, the point is this, is that uh, people who are early in their voiceover journey obsess over obsess over all their auditions and they take a half an hour to do an audition for a 15 second commercial, which is, I understand almost everybody does it. It's kind of crazy because to like what Johnny just said, most of the time within a few seconds, they know if they want you or not. And a part of it is just the, just the, the quality of your sound. Yeah. Do you sound like their uncle Morty that they had in mind? And if you don't, yeah. and they're not, open-minded, then you're, you're out. Um, and if you aren't able to engage them, be engaged and engaging immediately, you're done. That's true in all voiceover auditions. 100%. It's true That's, all, even on camera auditions. 100%. Oh, it's absolutely. I mean, sure, the aesthetics of a person on on camera, you know, do they look the way they want you to look? That's what got you in the door to do the audition in the first place. But once you open your mouth, if you're not immediately, I'm not saying you have to do something crazy or scream or cry no, or something. And either they like it. Here's the thing. When you guys started, if you probably, you've seen me or know me, see or know Tommy, but if you didn't, and you, you didn't know either one of us and saw us, you, you've decided, you've decided in mere seconds, whether or not you like us, it's human nature. And mm -hmm. to think that a casting director is not a human <laughs> and doesn't do that is crazy. They right. decide almost immediately. That's why commercial demos are about a minute long because, and it's just pieces of commercials. So they hear, they listen to this, this, and this on an audiobook demo, which is five, six, seven, eight different pieces. They're going to listen. If you say you're going to do male, female dialogue, that's got to start right away. Yep. Cause they're not going to listen to a minute of the narration to get to the male, female dialogue. If mm -hmm. you say you're going to do a French accent, it's got to start right away. Whatever you say, the piece is about, 
has to be there quickly because they're not going to wait for you. Yeah, because you know what? They've got laundry to do. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. they've got to go to the bathroom. They've got to order lunch and they've got to cast this project. And Lord knows how many other people they're listening to. Um, Karen Gilfry and Jamie Muffet cast the voice of the promo for their Vocation Cancun um, uh, voiceover conference, which will take place February 9th through 12th in Cancun. And they listened to hundreds of auditions um, and they did a podcast about it. It's fascinating if you want to go listen to it, to hear what their mindset became was when they started listening to the auditions and what it wound up being. And most of the time it wound up to, how can I disqualify this person as quickly as possible? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much right and yeah. because that's just human nature um and also these are two ex very experienced and very talented voice actors with excellent ears and discriminating you know they're just very discriminating um and they they degenerate devolved i'll say into that process which from what i hear for almost all of these voice seekers in almost every genre and way of getting auditions that's usually what winds up happening eliminating you is easier because then they have a smaller pool to pick from Right. Uh, Todd Todd brings out, he said, Union is trying to make all the audio, make all audiobooks Union, not sure if they'll succeed. Let me just address that one second. Please. Um, the un It's in the Union's best interest, in my opinion, in the actor's best interest, to be in the Union. And the Union wants Union work. However, the audiobook world is not rule one. It's the only part of Union work that isn't. Rule one means, <clears throat> I mean, let me tell you what it means. If I do a commercial that's non-Union, I can be penalized by the union any number of bad things could happen including a spanking um but they um i get my insurance my every I, I, union wages the union has worked with almost every publisher to make sure that there's a living wage an hourly wage it's all because the union did that that's not making it union we haven't forced them anybody to sign a contract but they have agreed to pay union minimums so in terms of success, they've been extremely successful in making sure not the publisher gets dinged or anything, but that the actor makes enough to do this. There was a time, and I'm not going to go, I'm not going to name names or do anything, but there was a time when a lot of actors were making $50, $60, $75 an hour. That's ridiculous. Because you're making 200 plus from almost everybody, that's because the union did that, plain yeah. and simple. And that's a, that's the work of the late, great Richard Ferone and other union workers who put that who made that happen so um it's 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 um it's important to understand the union isn't out to stop anybody from working they try to make it as easy as you can and even if you want to make a union uh, audiobook a union job they have one-off contracts there's a million things to do but they, they they've worked hard fair and equitably to make it right yeah absolutely um, I want to take this next question from Ravi. Can either of you share a lesson you learned the hard way from an experience? You guys are just awesome. This is also helpful. Thank you, Ravi. Um, I had a, 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 a near death experience, uh, metaphorically. Um, I have I have well, I have two managers now. I have one here in New York, and then I have a global manager, uh, which you know covers all the other markets. And I booked a gig through this manager. This was pre COVID. So that means I went to a recording studio that the client and end client had set up. I, you know, I did the gig. Everything went great. Client loved me. It was a relatively short session. You know, everything was just, you know, wonderful. And then one of the producers walked me out to, you know, the green, to the, you know, the main area so I could get out of there and collect my stuff. And I'm, and he's like, oh, you did a great job. The client loved you. Everything was great. And I'm like, oh yeah, cool. No, this is great. I'd love to work with you again. Here's my card. And he said, are you saying you want to go behind your agent's back? And I said, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant at all, which is not what I meant at all. I just thought I was doing good networking by exchanging contact information, where in fact, I risked destroying my relationship with this client and with my manager. So um, nothing happened. Fortunately, I honestly don't remember if I booked anything again with them. And if I didn't, it may just be because they just didn't have a project that I was right for. It's possible that I offended them. Uh, this was a while ago, and I'm still working with the same manager. I mean, I've booked stuff through them this year. I even had a, I was, I had a hold literally last week. So my relationship with them is fine. But um, you got to, that's, that's a lesson I learned. You got to be very, very careful when it comes to how you talk to people and how things, even though innocently intended, could be misconstrued. So Johnny, do you have a, 
uh, a lesson it's, you it's learned not, the hard it's way? It's not my story. I was there, but it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know if the lesson ever got learned, but I saw it firsthand. Um, you have to be careful. Um, with you have to understand your work day is your work day, and you've got to be um, professional for all of it. Um, I've been to <laughs> auditions and worse jobs, both commercial, uh, commercial stuff, auditions and jobs, where my partner in two different times. This 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 was oh, early nineties, I think. Um, the it didn't go off as well. The audition was horrible. The job was a, we had to recast the other person because they were just too coked up to work. <laughs> so, oh my! So the lesson. The hard way, the lesson is, if you're going to get blasted on anything, wait, wait till work's done. Um, so don't take I'm cocaine just, until just after they yell. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't hug. <laughs> oh, my good. And, and that just, happened what, what, two separate occasions? Yeah, yeah. One was With an two audition. different people. One was an audition. And, and it was just, I said, you know, I said, they, they, that, that, that character got to, had to go. You know, they, they, they sent the person home and they let me read with somebody else. And another one was a job, a different job. And the guy came, he's just, he was just fucked up. Can I say that on YouTube? He was, you just was, did. Uh, um, in the, in the, and that's bad on every possible level. And you think, <laughs> how would you, how, how do you have to, and I'll tell you one lesson, it was my own, my fault, my bad thing. I was talking what I thought, this was early days of, I think it was Twitter, one, one of those social things. And um, I was, denigrating this horrible, horrible. There was a guy who wanted me to do a book and it was awful. So I said, I would do it for $700 a finished hour. I thought, there's no way. And he said, yes. <laughs> so that's another lesson. So I I've done that do before too, to try to get rid of a client that I didn't want to work with. I yeah. overcharged and they said, okay, we'll take it. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, it was like a five hour book. And like, this is crazy. And it was so bad. And so I was um, texting this person I knew about this is the one I shared some, it was just, it was just horrible. But some of my texts went live onto, onto and I couldn't get rid of it. I just, I thought it was being in a private thing, but I wasn't. Oh. So the lesson here is don't, don't do that. But that was a long time ago and I still got my money. Oh, um, that's so funny because that, did you ever see the movie Chef? Uh, to John Favreau, like a uh, small film that he made. Mm -mm. Um, it's it, basically he's a chef and he's having a conversation with someone uh, like a food critic or something um, on Twitter. And he said, you wouldn't know a good you wouldn't know a good meal if it sat on your face. <laughs> and he thought he was sending it as a Twitter private message, but it turned out it was on. He posted it oh, and yeah. then he got fired. He got fired from the restaurant oh, as his high end that's chef. That's where a good meal goes, really. <laughs> It, yeah, great independent, great film. If you want to watch one, John Favreau, Chef. It's great. Anyway. All right. Okay, so we both have had, we've shared a couple of, you know, whoopsies. Um, uh, Union is trying to make all the audiobooks Union. Okay, uh, I wasn't aware that the, oh, uh, I it's wasn't- Stacey. I wasn't aware that union members couldn't do non-union work. Not a concern for me, but good to know in the future. Yes, that's what that's what's great about the, the audiobook contract. It's a great entryway for narrators- or any, if, if you want to do any voiceover, but you want to get in sag after to give you opportunities to do other things, a great entryway into sag after is narrating audiobooks because of the way that that collective bargain uh, agreement was uh, structured. Um, do the same for nonfiction. Johnny, question, do you ever hire a prepper? If sometimes yes, sometimes no, what are the circumstances that make the call for you? Yes, I do hire preppers occasionally. Generally, I have to know I need them to be vetted by someone who's used them. Um, I can't risk just trying somebody. Um, what I ask the prepper to do, here's what I ask the prepper to do. Generally, it's a long fiction book or nonfiction. I, I want them to tell me the synopsis of the the synopsis of the chapter, the action. I want to know the characters and a breakdown of the characters, who they would cast in their frame of reference. Um, what the author says about the voice quality, that sort of thing. Just to, and then also any, um, the pronunciation, uh, what's the word Joanna uses? The, you know, the uh, uh, phonetic pronunciation people have that weird looking writing. I don't want that. If it's like Tom, I'm a T-O-M-D-E-E-R, Tom Deer. I want to know how to say that. 
I don't want little umlauts and bullshit. I don't, I don't know how to read that. Oh, the phonetic, the phonetic, the yeah, phonetic well, alphabet. Like, you don't want uh, that. Knee, you know, J O then the word, then spell out knee. So I know how to say it. Um, I want that if it's not, and I want to know the pronunciation of all the places that are real or need to sound real, that sort of thing. And I do it. I need a prepper if, if I've got a lot of books in a row and I, I, if I believe I make what I make per finished hour uh, acting, I believe I make more if I spend too much time prepping. And I, I usually like to prep my own work. I do. But if I, if I'm slammed and I've got five books in a row coming up and I'm slammed right now. So I've got three of my books are four books right now are uh, one just got prepped and I finished. I'm waiting for the um, notes on two others. Um, and I find it helpful. I asked for one book to be prepped, but I went ahead and read it anyway because it was a really good book. <laughs> so I wanted to read it. But um, I advise you to make sure it's a trusted and a good prepper who works the way you need them to work. Um, they should be able to send you a sample of how they prep, what their style is, what they'll do in a reasonable price. And if it's agreeable to you, do it. If Even if it's being prepped, if you have time, you need to read some of it yourself just to get the feel. Um, and I think you need only to do this when you're heavily booked and your time is uh, precious and you want to make sure you're doing it. And, and you have to make sure that no one at the end of the result, no one will ever know that you didn't prep it, that someone else prepped it. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think, um, it, it's helped me out a lot sometimes. Um, and I'm also, also, I do it when I think I just don't have time, even though I generally do, I tend to work very fast. So I generally get things done. I find, oh, I could have done that. I could have prepped it. But I get nervous. If I'm, if I'm reading a book and I know I've got another one, I've got to get done right away. So I get a little nervous and afraid. I've never, ever, ever, ever been late on a book, ever. Right. I'm always early. And that's one of the reasons I get work all the time. Right. Two important points to walk away with what Johnny just said, everybody, is number one, I don't know any audiobook narrator or voice actor that got into voiceovers to be an audio engineer. Find people who are more interested in doing it than you and better than doing it that better than do better at doing it than you. Here's the other important point. Your time is more valuable than your money. Your time is more valuable than your money. And I know for a lot of people starting out in audio in audiobooks or voiceover in general that they have some they have problems with resources. If for your first one or two, or maybe even three audiobooks, you should be punch and rolling it. I mean, you should punch and roll all of them unless you go to a studio and they direct you, but that doesn't really happen much anymore. But you should be editing your own stuff because you need to understand how it works and why it works. And understanding how and why it works will influence your narration Wait, are you saying to make it easier. It? Um, both, both. At the beginning, prep your own audiobooks edit your own audiobooks so you understand how the process works but once you, but after that you should be outsourcing it because like i said your time is more valuable than your money because the amount of time that you think that you're spending on prepping or editing that you think you're saving money guess what you're not doing with all that time you're not marketing yourself to get your next audiobook because if you can pay somebody to edit your audiobook and you gain 10 hours of free time you can spend that 10 hours to book the next audiobook and that next audiobook will pay you more than you are paying that engineer to edit the current audiobook i, I will say i've done over a thousand audiobooks i have not i have not prepped five or six so far okay i've done and i've edited none of them i appreciate now i don't need to know how important editing i appreciate the people who can edit and master it. I, that's a special art. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the industry average is two hours in the studio for one finished hour. Now my, my rates better um, by, by some numbers, but um, if I do the editing and mastering, I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I don't know. How, <laughs> I don't know what you do. I don't know those wavy lines we make. I don't know what magic happens to those. Yeah. I make yeah. the wavy lines send them to the wavy line guy and, or girl, and they make a book, uh, you know, and I, I, have to, I, they send me all the things I screwed up and it looks, I, I see Bruce Kramer and Stacey Carolyn are having IPAs. Great idea, fellas. 
Ooh, I love a good Bass yeah, Ale. Nice IPA. Mm, it's India Pale Ale for those of you who don't know. Yeah, that's uh, not what they a very mean. bitter, a, 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 a bitter hoppy beer. Um, if you're into that, um, I went. I went to Maine with uh, uh, Robert Fass and uh, Neil Helgers, and with Robin Witten from Audio File Magazine some years hmm. ago, and we met her for lunch, and we're having and we went to some little bar, and I remember the story. We were having beers, and so there's some kind of beer. I can't remember what it was called. And that's a Tom Deere ale. So I said, well, what Ooh. about this Tom Deere ale? And the guy said, well, you know, it's not as hoppy as Monkey Fist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so there's that. <laughs> I don't know got, that. Okay. Lord knows yeah. how many Monkey Fists you've had in your time. Uh, I told you to ask me anything. Yeah. And he probably said it so casually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not as hoppy as a Monkey Fist. Okay. So like, yeah. Oh, give me a monkey fist then. <laughs> I assume it's a microbrew uh, oh, yeah. there, that's it's... in New England, unless they've got something really interesting practices going on up there. Uh, okay. Todd says, that was not a knock on union. I get my health care from them too. I was speaking with a rep and they said they would like to make all union and non and no non-union jobs for audiobooks. They may have a, they may have spoken a wish. That's entirely possible. But like I said, I think it's a great, I mean, you want to get people turned on and to the union and join the union. Keep that contract the way it is. It's just a great entry point for people to get in. So I, you know, um, Stacy, don't do coke until after the project is done. Those are the tips to keep. I think you, you skip down a little bit. It's oh, good. Chef is a great moving IPA, IPA. I think you pick Melinda. Up Melinda. Okay, can you discuss your direct marketing for audiobooks? I already DM for VO jobs like corporate or e-learning. I thought it was taboo to reach out to authors directly. What kind of DM is okay to pursue? Oh my goodness, no, there's no, there's no. Ta- you can reach out to authors. Oh yeah, authors. Authors want. Um, I go through. Joanna sent me a note. I don't understand about this. Anyway, I go through. Um, you can send that if you if if Johnny Heller wrote a book and you want to uh, um, and you want to do it, you can send me a note. And say I, I just read your book. It's fantastic. I don't know if you have an. I don't know if you're planning an audio book. I would love to be the person you, you. Absolutely there. And you know what else you can do. Uh, you can go to, uh, um, oh, that's right. Joanna's point. I go through publishers, not AC. I rarely go through ACX, mm-hmm. um, but they are in ACX. You can reach out to authors in ACX. You can reach out to authors via their agents. You can look up uh, authors, let's say the mystery writers of Cleveland or the Ohio or wherever it is, and you can go to their conventions. <laughs> the thing is, if you're going to go to a convention, set up a little table, I'm Melinda Beck, the, uh, the audiobook person who's going to do your book. You need to know how to take them from the book to the finished product. You need right. to process. Right. Take them through the you journey. Need to know who to, what publisher yeah. to work with, what distributor to work with. I mean, there's, there's so many. There's a uh, Spectrum Audio and Pink Flamingo and all these independent publishers you can use. But it's not taboo to reach out to authors at all. Nor is it taboo to reach out to publishers. You need, however, to have a website with demos, a profile, and you can be brand new. It's okay. This is not this is not a job. If you get a job on Broadway today, you're a Broadway actor. You're not a new Broadway actor. You're a Broadway actor. You're getting Broadway money, whatever it is. If you're if you're a baseball player, you're making. If you're if you're a first year major league ball player, you're making seven hundred thousand dollars minimum. Mm-hmm. That's how it goes. If you're better than that, you're going to make millions. Yeah, uh, it's uh, we have this unfortunate idea that. I'm new and I'm not very good yet. So I'm doing these crummy jobs so I can learn. Like, no, don't do any shitty jobs. Don't do bad books. It makes you a guy or a girl who does bad books. That's not valuable. Mm-hmm. Bad experience is only going to teach you uh, how, to be, how to be good at bad things. Yeah, all it does is teach you to devalue yourself and training yes. the authors to devalue you. Yeah, so you can um, direct... Mark, you can find authors and authors convention, authors groups, authors agents, reach out to them. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to build on that is that another place that I found is an interesting place to connect with authors, comic cons. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I produce a comic book, Agent 122. That's one and, a, and a, the number two and the number two, agent122.com. And what I discovered when I and my partner was getting um, a booth, a table at Artist Alley, and we were promoting our comic book, is that I was looking around and often there'd be author's alleys where there'd be just rows and rows. And it's mostly fantasy and sci-fi um, authors because it kind of lines up with the pop culture genre that's a comic con. But I would pass around my business cards and I would talk to people all the time and make connections. 
The other thing is that if you do uh, the direct marketing stuff that Johnny's recommending, if it's you approaching an author who either have never considered turning their book into an audio book or have concerned it, considered it but don't know how, now you can educate them. You can train them, not just on a, here are the distributors, here's the platforms, here's the formatting, but on what we talked about early on, which is, this is how much you pay us. This is the industry standard for compensation. So if you get them early, where you are training them on how the industry works, how to work with the publishers, the distributors, and how to work with voice actors and pay them effectively, you are lifting up everybody in the industry by doing that. So yes, there are tons of direct marketing opportunities. Never feel uh, reticent to approach an author about it because some of them may say, oh, I'm already on ACX. You say, oh, that's great. you know, Or, you know, I've been talking to my publisher about that, but we don't know how to go about it. Oh, well, let's talk about Findaway or Spotify and all yeah. that stuff. So you can educate them. And then, and if you actually book the book, now you've got somebody in your stable who may want to do six books with you. And then let me jump on that too. If you're going to do that, you need to be good. Well, that's, yes. Uh, the lovely Angela Scapatura asked a question here. The biggest piece of advice for newer narrators. I think one of the things a lot of newer narrators and some, some not so new narrators forget about is that this is acting. I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you come from Microsoft or I don't hotel. I don't care where you come from. It's acting. You need to study acting. You need to get, you need to understand performance. You know, I think you should take some acting workshops, plain and simple. I think you need to understand that uh, you're sharing, if fiction or nonfiction, you're telling a story. And I think you don't have to be a, a, a graduate of the Yale School of Drama or anything, but you need to, you need to understand acting. It's not just a good voice. It isn't. A good voice is better than a shitty voice, but it's not, it means nothing. You, you, need, to, you need to understand acting. So my advice to new narrators, first, don't worry that you're new. There are going to be some mistakes. Learn as much as you can so the mistakes are minimized, whether the mistakes are in editing, mastering, technical. But the performance mistakes are probably because you need to know how to play things. You can be too loud, too big. You, you need to understand the, the basics of the art of audiobook acting. And there's a million coaches, and I think you should take advantage of some of the better ones, plain and simple. Yeah. And then D asked about Studio One, about punch. Are there other DAWs that allow punch and roll? Here's a technical question I can answer. Yes. Adobe Audition is what I use, and it has a punch and roll feature. No, Pro Tools does, Reaper yep. does, everything yep. does. Mm -hmm. you know, everything's, everything's got, you can punch and roll on all of them, otherwise you don't use it. Right. We've got time for one more question and then we need to wrap it up. Anybody else have another question or comment or musing, an amusing musing before we uh before we before we end? Are we good? Going once? Well, let's give him a second. Dun, 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 dun. Well, that's hence the going once. Oh, that's right. Twisted wave. Yep. Twisted wave has punch and roll. Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, anything, you've got to have punch and roll to do this. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, if you use him, it doesn't have it, then quit using it. Yeah, because it's a bear to narrate an audiobook without punch and roll. Uh, it's, it's, not a bear, it's wrong. It's, yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. Not also, it's best practice. It's the way to do it. Because mm -hmm, once you kind of build that muscle memory of knowing where to place the, you know, just pausing, keeping your microphone placement in the same your position to the microphone, just being able to click on it, you get your two to five seconds or whatever is your comfort level, five seconds probably for leading you in and then just continue with your performance. I mean, it's a skill, it's a muscle that you need to develop, but once you get it, once you get it, uh, I mean, you're, you, you go so much faster. I mean, I punch and rolled my last book. I finished it a week or two ago. I was going about an hour and 15 per hour. I was just, it was also nonfiction. There was no big words, no dialects or anything. But, um, you know, if you're, if you got that muscle developed, that skill didn't develop, you can really crank it. You can really crank them out. Hey, I, right. I may have the last question. I have a question. Please. What are you and Marnie doing for dinner? You guys want to come up here and have something? Uh, <laughs> I will check with Marnie. She, she walked in a few minutes ago. I'll see if, I'll see, I'll see if I'm, she's. I'm, I know it's early, but I'm, I'm old man hungry now. I want to go to, I want to go to Denny's for the early bird. Ooh, Grand Slam. Yeah. <laughs> Word. <laughs> 
All right, I, I was willing to move to Florida just for early birds. Just for the just for the early bird specials the for the, at, the, at the at the Golden Corral or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. So Johnny, as a as an audiobook coach, where and uh, presenter of conferences and appearances, where can people find you and how can they work with you? I'm writing it down. No, you tell them. <laughs> Uh, johnnyheller.com i'm writing it down also so www.johnnyheller.com i think there's three w's and then me um and you can email me um at um i think i have ones just for coaching but i forgot what it is already hang on it is uh johnny heller vo coach at gmail.com johnny heller vo coach at gmail.com and and we can and i'll uh i'll let you um and i'll and i'll coach the shit out of you Oh my. Yeah. Um, and if you'd like to work with me, you can go to VOStrategist.com. Feel free to book a free 15 minute consult. I specialize in business and marketing consulting. Um, and we also you can also check out my video library. I have I have 25 videos now that you could purchase at the VOS shop. I have a books and gear recommendation page. Um, you can also hook up with me for a diagnostic, a strategy session, or you can check out my mentorship program, which is a series of 30 minute check-ins that you can do once a week, once a month, or twice a month, so I can help you with your voiceover business progress. All right, everybody, thank you so much for attending. Johnny, thank you so much for uh, hanging out for the hour, and thank everybody, thank your patience with my lack of technical uh, prowess, but uh, we got it in, we got it done. All right, so everybody have a fantastic uh, night. Stay cool, stay safe, happy holidays, and happy voicing. And happy right. new year. Okay, and happy new year. All right, bye, everybody. Bye-bye. And we're out. Okay. All right. That was uh, fun. I think I think we're still on the YouTube live. So, um, oh, oh. so that that was awesome. Uh, thank I'm, you so I'm much. Leave.